Hello there, everybody. Welcome along to EFL Debate. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, football manager uh, Dine Marmria. Uh, Dine, lovely to see you as always. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, what's the silver lining of a bit of time out of work for a manager? Uh, a bit of time to rest and reflect, I guess? Uh, yes, I enjoyed the first month, uh, but now I'm bored. Uh, <laughs> the wife giving me too many jobs around the house already, so <laughs> I'm ready to go again. Uh, but no, I think the first that first month because it's relentless, especially the how I've been working uh, is has been uh, you know non-stop really, uh, and that took its toll on on the, on the kids, especially and when you when you get home on on Sunday or Wednesday, and you're on your laptop all day watching games, and uh, and your eight-year-old daughter tells you, uh, Daddy, any time, any chance you're going to spend some time with us? That really hurts sometimes, but I understand yeah. the job that we're in at the time. It was uh, uh, you have to do everything everything you can. Mm. Do you think managers sometimes feel um, part of them feels guilty that although they're in a really well paid job, you know, it does mean I've heard Gary Rowett talk on podcasts saying, um, you know, I, I, I leave for a job when my son or my daughter's 11 and then I come back and they're 15 and it's, uh, you know, you miss a bit of their their life almost. Do you think um, that does that relate? You know, can you relate to that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Uh, they, they don't all get paid well, by the way. <laughs> do, relatively but, speaking yeah uh, but yeah for sure I think I remember 2015 I think I took the job at Southport Football Club uh, mm. in the National League and I live in Harvardshire and another time I was out of a job and I, and I fancied going back to management and uh, and it looked really attractive I went there we won a lot of games uh, you enjoy that winning feeling and then when you were your kids at the time my kids were I think Maya she was just about born and Leah was only two year old and then, and then it was really difficult. And then you, yeah, I realized that was really important at the time. And, and I left after six months, I think. Um, but the other jobs I've got, they've been manageable uh, because as manager, what you can't do is you can't keep moving. Uh, mm. You know, I think the average manager is twelve months in a job. Uh, and you, yeah. can't keep, you can't keep moving the family, so um, you got to make it work. Uh, Burton wasn't too far for me. Um, I, I, but I still did the hours, uh, you know, I get there the night before the training, uh, I get to uh, to the club at seven, half seven, and don't leave the work till about seven again in the evening. Um, you don't really have days off because uh, my schedule was uh, come back on a Saturday night after a game. Uh, the first thing I do is obviously see the kids, they go to sleep, and then uh, watch the Football League show, and after that, uh, I watch the game back. Uh, win, lose, or draw. I always watch it back uh, at least once. I put some clips together that I want to show the players on Monday. Uh, then, then Sunday, get my head around it. Uh, take my little boy to football on Sunday morning, and then Sunday afternoon, all spent watching the opposition game. If we got a game on Tuesday, I watch two or three games in the afternoon. If we got the game the following Saturday, then at least I watch a game from next our next opposition. So. I'm ready for that Monday morning meeting with the players to go back to the the previous weekend performance, analyze that quickly, and then to look forward for the following game. So I've I've got to do that, and then and then during the week, I, I average I watch five or six games of the opposition, and not just watch them. I've got to clip them as well because uh, imagine watching five six games of the opposition, and you got to make a, a three minute video to present to the players on Friday. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you got to be you got to. Uh, uh, leave an impact on the players, you know. So uh, it's a, but listen, that's the job. I loved it. I love it. Uh, that's what I was born to do. Um, and and yeah, it's uh, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't, mm -hmm. as we all see. Do you know what? It's really interesting that um, the, the sort of boiling down like hours of watching an opposition team into a three minute video, because I think that's part of what management's about, because you can have like the sharpest, um, you know, most scientific, absolute pinpoint brain in the world. Um, when it comes to football and tactics, but then you've got to communicate it in a way that the players can understand. And I feel like for management, you've kind of got to be able to have both sides of that coin, haven't you? Well, for sure. I think uh, that's one of, uh, I met Jurgen Klopp last season, I think. And that's one of the things that I ask him because he looks quite relentless, hardworking as well. And, and I've asked him, I says, how do you how do you manage that? He says in his early years as a manager, he used to do exactly what I'm doing right now. He says the club's got bigger for him and, uh, and he had a lot of staff. 
Uh, and he says basically what he does now. He doesn't watch a game back on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday. He enjoyed it with the family. Uh, then he got his, uh, I think he says, nine members of staff and analysis department. They'll bring him uh, 20 minutes uh, of the opposition or their previous games. They all analyze it on Monday morning and that gives him a good understanding of everything. And then he picks out that 20 minutes. Mm. And I said, well, hopefully one day I'll have that many staff to do that. <laughs> uh, but when, when you're at Burton Albion, uh, with the resources that we have, uh, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to work and work and work. Yes, absolutely. You're certainly making your own cups of tea at Burton Albion, that's for sure. Um, I want. What do I need to understand, um, Dino, about your um, influences and your early life, I guess, uh, in order to subsequently understand how your mind works and what makes you tick as a manager? Well, I think uh, I think you're right. You're spot on. I think uh, everybody, their background, uh, plays uh, a pivotal role in terms of our uh, later life progression, everything else, and that resilience you build over a period of time. It shapes for who you are. Um, obviously, I grew up uh, in the south of Tunisia. Um, under I was born under a mountain in the desert. Right. Um, I think we were all uh, Tunisian national team in 1978. We qualified to the World Cup at the time. Only one African team qualified to the World Cup. And we all listened to the radio. My early memory, listened to the radio. Tunisia beat uh, Mexico 3-1 uh, right. and drew with Poland nil-nil. And then they lost uh, a narrow loss to uh, West Germany, I think. Uh, no, they lost to Poland 1-0 and they drew with uh, Germany nil-nil. Oh, which is an unbelievable achievement at the time. And that got me hooked on football. Uh, and as early as six-year-old, seven-year-old, all I wanted to be is a footballer. Mm. Um, I was obsessed with it. Um, and then uh, and then obviously I was I was fortunate. I always tell players now, always uh, perform at your best because you never know who's watching you. Yeah. And I got, and I got picked up twice. Uh, once... Uh, once playing with, with with my friends bare feet in 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 uh, in all weather pitch uh, playing football and I got picked up by one of the big clubs in Tunisia. Uh, I, I I quit my studies, although my father wasn't appreciative of that. But I didn't tell him that I was going. He found out. <laughs> he found out two weeks later through the media that I signed right. for this club in the capital. And right. uh, uh, was he pride? Do you know what? Uh, pride is not a word we use. Because okay. uh, because even if he was proud, he never told me that. Right. I was never comfortable by, by uh, my family involved in football because football is quite a brutal business. Yeah. And I always tried to protect the family away from that. I think my father watched me once in a live game. Yeah. Uh, maybe he watched me on TV, uh, but he never told me. He never says, oh, I'm proud of you or well done. And any. We, we, we don't do that at the, my upbringing anyway. Uh, and then from there, I picked on to go to Burnley Football Club and... Uh, and that's itself is a story. And then, and then from Tunisia, from the south of Tunisia, you got to Berlin Football Club in 1995. Yeah. And, uh, and you can imagine the culture shock, uh, <laughs> make that journey. And, and back in the 90s, football was, uh, was different. Uh, most English clubs, they just have English players or Scottish yeah. players or Irish players. There isn't many foreign players. Yeah. I think with the, with the Premier League from 95, 96, when we start seeing... Uh, like Aspria came in and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. more for an import. I remember Dennis Bergkamp and all that. But the yeah. culture was very much a British culture, very much, you know, uh, my early days, I, you know, I came from a, a coffee culture. You know, you go to the coffee shop in Tunisia, you go to the, you know, you don't go to the pubs, really. You don't have pubs. Yeah, sure. Then I wanted the coffee. By the, sorry, by the way, I prefer the coffee culture. I think it's much better. Yeah. I'm much better have a cup of coffee than a, than a pint, personally. Yeah, now you say that, but if you go back 1995, 96, and you go to the pub with your friends and order a coffee, they look at you funny. What are you doing? So, <laughs> so uh, I remember, you know, nowadays a lot of coffee shops, but yeah. honestly, in the, in the 90s, there were barely any coffee shops. If you want a coffee, you got to go to Max Spencer's coffee, cafeteria bit to get a coffee. So, uh, and the weather and everything else. And then I got um, an injury which kept me out of, of the game for about 18 months. Oh. And, uh, and then obviously you don't have an agent at the time, your English is limited. And, uh, and I, got, I got into coaching quite early. Um, while I was doing rehab, I, I was coaching at Burnley Football Club Academy. 
Uh, so uh, I really... how did that conversation come about, Dino? When you you're injured, did you go to them and say, "Could I do a bit of coaching at the academy? yes, yes, yeah. exactly that. I wanted to embrace British culture. I wanted to understand the, more of the, the the football culture and the football language. Um, I have to change everything if I'm honest with you, Gabby, because I remember signing for Doncaster Rovers. Ian Snowden was the manager, ex Everton. I'm playing hey. a team. Uh, the, the goalkeeper was. Uh, What's his name? The ex-Everton, the big boy, uh, legend of Everton. Oh, um, I want to say Ted Sager, but it's a bit late. No, no, no. Uh, Neville, uh, Neville Southall. Neville Southall, there you go. Neville Southall, uh, playing with the team. Steve Nicol, Liverpool legend. Uh, Mike Newell. Uh, Ian Akis uh, won uh, the Premier League with Blackburn. So I was uh, uh, John Sheridan. So that's the team where I signed to play with Doncaster Rovers, and that was quite an eye-opener. The character of those players, the demand of those players, and... And obviously, the demand of the league as well. I had to change my game. I was a quite a technical player, a North African technical player. I had a bit of pace by me. I could not head the ball for, for anything. And then I had to adjust my game. I had to work my head in. I had to work in my game to survive. And uh, and, uh, and that's why I tell players now, you always, when you work on things, uh, things will, will come off. I think by the time I finished playing uh, football, I was a notorious, aggressive centre forward who scored goals with his hands and with both feet. Which yeah. is something that, if you go back when I first came to Ugna, I was never that, that type of player. But yeah, I go into coaching uh, quite early. I was still playing. So I train in the day. Uh, and then in the evening, I go to evening a week. I take Burnley Football Club on the 14, 13, or 16. Mm. Uh, and then on a Sunday, we play, I play on a Saturday. And then on a Sunday, I take one of these teams to play games against Preston, against Carlisle. So I kind of knew my journey straight away. I knew that I got to an age where I'm not going to play at the top. Uh, I played National League all, all my career in England. Uh, I, I got to the Football League with Steven in 2010. Uh, but mainly I played National League. So I knew that, you know, when you get that age, you're not gonna really going to get picked by a bigger club. And uh, and I knew that coaching and management my next thing. Uh, and I, I'm you know, uh, I put myself in that journey quite early. I got my qualification quite early. Uh, by the time I got my first managerial job at Northwich Victoria 2007, uh, I've already done thousands of training sessions. I've already done hundreds of team talks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm already, I've done already that journey there. And that's something that I always tell players nowadays. While you're still playing, if you want to go to coaching management, you've got to get the work done quite early. So, so when, when yeah. that chance comes in, you're ready for it. But then I think it also takes a certain amount of determination to when you did have that 18 month layoff to say, I'm going to make something of this time. Because I think, you know, footballers with a different mentality would say, well, I'm, I'm still getting paid. I'm just going to I'm going to sit back and, um, and and take the money in. But that seemed to that that clearly that wasn't your approach. It was yeah, like, absolutely. Right, absolutely. Can, what's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And not just that, I, you know, they're quite known. I'm quite well known in Tunisia back then. And the clubs in Tunisia, they're asking me to come back as well. And there was a lot of that. But I, I, I wanted to uh, perform in my, uh, outside my comfort zone, if that makes sense. I was determined uh, to make my story success. I've always been determined from my young age, uh, you know, to uh, to get brought up where I was brought up or where I was born, to be a professional footballer itself. It's a miracle. From there to end up playing in, in Europe, in England, the, the home of football, it's another miracle. So... Uh, determination, resilience, commitment, uh, passion for the game, all those are traits probably uh, I took with me all my life. And probably if, you, if anybody will, will going to describe me, that they were the thing they described me. That's why, who I am. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, there is always perception of what people think of you, but I've always said this perception is not who you are. Uh, who you are is your character, is what, is what you built over how life shaped you, if that makes sense. Mm. And and I imagine um, sort of that mentality was maybe enhanced by working under Graham Wesley. Uh, no, I think my, my my personality. Graham liked my personality. He was uh, he yeah. liked what, what I'm about. He uh, right. he was a manager of Farber, I think, at the time, and uh, and I, I played against his teams a few times. Uh, he liked what I'm about. Uh, he liked my winning traits. And he was determined two or three times to sign me uh, and, and finally signed me. And then he put me in my, his coaching staff as well because he resonated in his, uh, he liked my character, my personality. I wouldn't say he shaped me, uh, okay. my life shaped me, but he liked my traits, if that makes sense. And, yeah, uh, sure. and, and he, probably, he probably saw that 
to complete his success, if that makes sense. That's probably what I, I gave him was ingredient he needed in his backroom staff to harness what he's already got. And, uh, and, and that worked pretty well because, uh, because we had some, some success together. Uh, okay, maybe didn't shape your mentality. Maybe that just came sort of from within you at an earlier stage. But I'm, I'm also wondering if it did shape you at all in terms of um, how to manage, because uh, Graham Wesley was an absolute master at Stevenage in terms of building teams, plucking players out of non-league and building teams that are absolutely horrible to play against and sort of fought their way up the leagues and was you know became much bigger than the sum of their parts. Uh, there is no doubt Graham had a... Uh... Some, some unbelievable trait as a, as a human being first and as a leader as well. Uh, he managed his company, he managed people at a young age, so he got a lot of experience for that. Uh, but for me, as a young coach at the time, as a player who just finished playing, you take a lot of, uh, and, and it's cliche and everybody say it, you take a lot of every manager you play for, you take a few things from them. And, uh, and I, I remember, as young as, as I remember, one of my earliest coaches back in Tunisia, uh, he told me once, uh, you got to love the game, first and foremost. It's not going to be smooth. Uh, the journey is never going to be smooth. But your love of the game get you over the tough periods. And that always took with me. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, so, so a lot of managers that you play for, you associate with, uh, you'll take some trace from them, no doubt about it. Mm. Yes, yeah, certainly did. Um, well, you, you must have some really fond memories of um, your time as a player at Stevenage as well. Uh, my fond memory, um, I honestly, uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say fond memory because I lost the playoff final, I think, against Carlisle in 2005. Right. Uh, that's probably the biggest disappointment I had in football. Uh, but in terms of you know the journey, you played a lot of football. Um, it's uh, I think you playing. You I wouldn't you wouldn't say you enjoy it at the time. You look back at it now. Uh, it was easy life because yeah. you train. You were quite selfish as a player. Uh, you win, lose, draw. Uh, losing will hurt you a little bit, but not as much as you are as a coach or as a manager. Sure. Uh, you get paid well as a player. You get looked after, so I wouldn't say you know it, it's not. Uh, it, it, there is a lot more satisfaction achieving as a coach or as manager than a player. That's for sure. That's my experience. Uh, everybody different, but for me, I think I think my my biggest fond memory happened as a manager and a coach. Well, let's uh, move on to um, your experience as a manager and a coach, because um, early on in your career at uh, Southport and Nuneaton, uh, you very quickly, um, I guess, assembled a reputation for taking teams that are in really difficult situations and uh, taking them into sort of playoff contention. And um, I'm just wondering, what was your sort of blueprint for, for doing that? Um, I suppose at Southport, first of all. Well, before Southport, actually, it was Northwich Victoria. Uh, of course, yeah. Yeah, Northwich Victoria was one of the good clubs in National League at the time. Uh, I was playing for near Redfin, uh, and we had a horrific start to the season. I was 36, 37 at the time. I think we got one point out of 14 games. Uh, near Redfin moved on. The chairman rang me at the time. He said, Dino, I heard you're a good character in the dressing room. The players like you. Uh, you've been coaching at the Burnley Academy for a long time. Uh, the club was going through a difficult period anyway, financially at the time, and he asked me to take the team. Obviously, I didn't think much about it, and um, and, I, and I took the team at the time, thinking it was like impossible task. Uh, but again, you go back to that determination, that resilience that I built over years, uh, probably determination or anything, because if I look back in my first managerial job, I didn't really know anything as... As much as I know now, that's for sure. And I'm thinking, well, to to keep them up that season and to get to 47 points and to stay up with two games to spare, uh, I remember Chris Wilder sending me a text because he was Halifax manager at the time. Yeah. Uh, bloody hell, you know, he needed snookers. How do you do it? <laughs> uh, and, and doing it, actually, we, we end up beating Stevenage at Stevenage 2-1, Stevenage Peter Taylor, the time manager. And it's a game for us. If we win, we stay up. And if they win, they get in the playoffs and beat them a Stevenage 2-1. Uh, 
um, and uh, so so that's that's probably and that's just pure uh, work ethic i led by example in terms of my work ethic i led with my passion i led, led with my determination and the players uh, they responded to that really well and uh, and and that probably spread into them, them to the dressing room and, and they became almost like me. They, you know, they, they covered every blade of grass. Uh, they showed determination everything they do. They showed commitment and the results were followed. And then mm-hmm. after that, obviously, uh, like you said, Southpaw, Southpaw, I think we were bottom of the league with eight points to drift from the bottom, from the, the to safety. Mm-hmm. And then and then my blueprint is not really a blueprint. Uh, any... Uh, you look at teams when they're struggling down at the bottom. The first thing you look at is the confidence shot to pieces. Yeah, there is no doubt there is some good players there. So uh, you got to build that confidence. The psychology part is uh, is the most important bit because when you walk into the room, they're not really interested how good you are tactically. What they're interested in can you make connection, personal connection with each mm-hmm. individual player. You want that every player that go home that day to think, even someone who's not been part of it, think, oh, I like this guy. I like this guy. This guy is, he's doing it for me because I know players are very selfish. It's all about themselves. So you, you've got to find the connection with them, find what uh, what stimulates them, what makes them feel important. And then the football bit will come to, to be. So when they come in on Saturday, uh, you make them as, as seven foot tall, eight foot tall, like he says. Um, and if you do that, if you, if you build that confidence, the rest of you will, will you know, will follow because there is no doubt about it. Any player, any level, they are there for a reason because they got some qualities. So, so yeah. I've done that job at uh, Southport and on it in the same. Um, just uh, again, from the bottom, took them, left them on the verge of the playoffs. Southport, from the bottom, left them on the verge of the playoffs. Uh, Stevenage, to be fair, when I took Stevenage in 2018, they had 10 games, I think, to play. They were yeah. both from bottom or third from bottom. And I remember the chairman at the time saying, uh, you know, wherever you go, you win games. I want some of winning my club, football club. And the first thing is, uh, we cannot imagine going down to National League again. And yeah. we've gone, I think, last 10 games, won five out last 10 games. We kept them up. And then, obviously, the following season, we've done really well. To, we lost to them. Uh, we didn't get to the playoffs. Finished ninth, I think, following season, something like that. Ten, yeah, nine. yeah. We missed out on the playoffs with one point. Uh, and then yeah, the it was that late red coast. Got three scored a lot of goals towards the end of the season, but you just yeah, just we, yeah, we, we got a good team. We got uh, we got a plane, and uh, and yeah, and then you lose one or two of those players in the summer. You have a difficult mm-hmm. rebuild in the, in, in the summer, and uh, and then you struggle for the, the following game. So, so yeah, I build this uh, reputation of firefighter where I pick the teams from the bottom to to pick them up and get uh, and get them winning, keep them safe. Now I'd like to think that I build enough credit to to build the next bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Well, that's, I'd like to get onto that a little bit because um, I feel like you, you've been incredibly successful with um, you know the jobs that you've had and the phases that you've been asked to do. Um, sometimes the, the next step has maybe been difficult, partly because of losing players and maybe the lack of investment at, at certain in certain situations. Is there a possibly uh, is there possibly a consideration from your point of view to maybe drop down a league or two in order to take a job where you can afford to be a bit more ambitious and you're not firefighting um, every year? Um, because I. I I'd want to see, you know, that side of you, you know, the Dino Mamre who can take a team and be in more of a sort of playoff chasing or promotion chasing situation. Listen, uh, drop 11 or drop 11, I don't really look at it like that way. You earn the right to get to a level. Uh, I've been coaching, managing for over 15 years, 17 years. Uh, I manage a lot of games. I've been assistant manager for a lot of games, hundreds. Uh, I built enough credit. I take pride in terms of uh, my coaching ability, my how I break the game down to the players, how I develop players. Uh, without standing big-headed, um, uh, that's probably my strength. Uh, if you ask any of my players, what's Dino like on the grass? They, they, they will tell you what Dino like on the grass. What's Dino mm-hmm. like in the meeting room, breaking the game down and all the rest of it. So. Uh, there is no reason why I wouldn't get why I'd have to drop down a, a division or two. And by the way, I'm not really turning my nose on anything. Yeah, uh, I just want a good project. But but sometimes you think, well, I think, well, I've earned the right to be League One manager over time. League One manager, 
uh, last season over 38 games. I finished ninth in the form table uh, with with next to nothing with bottom end league, league to budget, by the yeah, way. Sure, absolutely. Uh, last last 20 games of last season, after I changed 10 players in, 11 players out, big, big changes. Actually, 20 games, uh, won 10, uh, lost six, drew four. 50% win ratio, the form table over the last 20 games, seventh, just outside the playoffs. So I'm proven at League One level. Uh, this season, at Burton Albion, I'll go back to this uh, again. Uh, let me just talk about the numbers before I go to the details. Okay, sure. Yeah. The, uh, okay. We, we, I got sacked because we lost four games on the bounce. We lost to Portsmouth, top of the league. We lost to Peterborough, they were just second. And we lost Stevenage, fourth or fifth in the league. Uh, the disappointing game, the fourth one was against Northampton, but actually Northampton, they've gone for an unbelievable run since. Yeah. Uh, so those four games got sacked. Um, that's the nature of the business. Who am I? If you lost four games, you, you got sacked, you got sacked. But actually the month before that, if you look at October, uh, we played seven games, we won five and we drew two. And I'm not really adding the cup, uh, the cup games against Wrexham and against uh, the draw against Port Vale and the win against Mansfield. So, so to win five games, draw two games, in seven games, arguably we picked up, I don't know, what's that, uh, 17, 17, 17 points. points, yeah. 17 points from 21. So, so did, I, did I deserve to get the sack? Absolutely not. Uh, but obviously the, the decision maker, decision maker. And, and there is something as well I would like to, I'm going to take this opportunity because uh, I think the EFL, as crazy as it sounds, they should make rules. I think this season there's been 12 sacking in League One. 11, 12 sacking. Yeah. And I think that's really harsh on managers. Uh, and I think how you should be a judge as a manager is with your budget. The Football League is produced a budget. Everybody, if your budget is bottom three or bottom two or bottom one, and you are 14th, 15th in the league, you should never be sacked. If you are above, where it should be, you should, you should you should never be sacked. You should give him time to. You, you can't be sacking manager. So, uh, and again, maybe I'm talking from a selfish point of view because I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, well, produce what I produced with Burton last season. Yeah. Then the budget get cut again, and my budget at Burton, uh, without getting the numbers out, it's bottom half League Two budget. There is no doubt about it. Yeah. You work, you work you absolute miracles to bring some of the players you bring in to try and compete in League One level. I'm quite ambitious. I want to I wanna be the, the top 10 in League One. I back myself to do that. You get what you get. You start the season, you lose three or four key players in 20-man squad because you've got to utilize your small budget very, very wisely. You do that in the summer and it's really hard work. Then you lose three, four players. That will affect your team, no doubt about it. I remember that we lost first game to, to Blackpool. We lost... Uh, two or three players the first game of the season, and then play Leicester City in the Cup on the Tuesday and lose another two or three players. The third game at home against Derby County, I had half the team out that I worked with throughout the preseason. When you don't have enough depth in the squad, you the, it is going to catch up with you. So if you are Burton Albin, you just got to be patient. I've always said it, success, you either need money, which is a big budget to, to produce, to, to go and get players and good players at the level, or you need time to build a team. I believe uh, over time we're building a quite a good team at Burton. Um, I, I left good squad of players. If they all fit, they'll be fine. They'll be top half team, no doubt about it. Uh, and and above all is always. I remember Arsene Wenger saying, uh, "Always leave the club better, in a better place than when you took it." Yeah. Came to Burton Albion as a manager. They were bottom of the league, eight or nine points adrift, and then we kept them up with Jimmy. And then when I took the job from Jimmy, nine games, one point. Um, when I left in, November, in, in December, I think four or five points above the relegation zone. Uh, yeah. And not just that, the, the transformation of the players. In my time, we sold the three players for a fair bit of money at the level for Burton Albion. And that's Gassana Hadmi, and that's uh, Victor to Bolton, and that's Terry Taylor. Uh, and not just that. Talk about players developing for me as a coach. I take pride in developing players. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the players over my time, you know, when I took Sam Hughes as centre back, Sam Hughes was lost in, 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 in amongst conceding goals. And now Sam Hughes, one of the top defenders in the league, and everybody will give me up about him. 
You look at Dejio Chilaja, who was about to leave the football club. And now he's instrumental. He's the heartbeat of the team. I find him a position as attacking midfielder in the heart of the team. Joe Powell, who's, who's about to leave the club as well. I dropped Joe Powell playing a little bit deeper as a number four yeah. because I want to get on the board. But I gave him responsibility to be disciplined as well. And he's been outstanding. And again, the phone keep, people keep ringing me about Joe Powell, as he like. And then I signed Mark Helm for, for nothing from Burnley Football Club. What um, signing that was for the second half. Was that was, like you say. So, so you look at those players. Uh, you got Max Crocom from Grimsby next to nothing. And, and, that's, and that's where I probably this season. Listen, first thing is, when you take a job, the, what's the objective? So my objective about Burton was to keep them up last season. Yeah. Clear. We've done that. What I wanted the summer is to try and at least keep the same budget to build something sustainable and to try and attack that t- top 10 position. I couldn't get the resources that I needed for, for, for that job, but I still backed myself to do that. Uh, now, the next thing is still going to stimulate me. He's not going to stimulate me. I kept Burton last two uh, twice. On, on, it's, that job has been done. It doesn't stimulate me anymore. The next thing now, I believe I'm a good coach. I want to develop my players. I want to play some attractive football. So I wanted Burton Albion to play, to have an identity way of playing. I want to play attractive football. You see it all over now. Football moved on so much, so much, you know. And, and you see how team is built from the back. Uh, the rotation between uh, fullback going to midfield or into out or out to in. Uh, there is so many things that tactically players want to want to improve they watch it on sky they want to be part of that they want to develop if goalkeeper you want to play with his feet he want to develop if you're center back he want to step in with the ball so i didn't want to carry on uh, okay max get a goal kick get everybody in uh, in 20 meters uh, area and kick it there and pick it play a second ball i moved on from that that doesn't stimulate me anymore as a coach I want to play properly. I want to develop players. I want to develop my goalkeeper, Max Crocom, because, as example, because he want to play in the championship. To play in the championship, you've got to be good at your feet. I want to develop Sam Hughes because he should play in the championship. He wants to play in the championship. So I don't want to get Sam just kicking it and heading it because he's better than that. And my job to work with him to make him a better player with the ball as well. Same with Joe Powell, same with Deji, same with, same with Mark Helm, same with Sweeney, the centre-back. I don't want my centre-back just heading it and kick it. I want them to be comfortable playing. I want my team to be playing good, attractive football. That is going to take a little bit of time. And, uh, and I remember the week before I leave, uh, I was having an interview with, 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 with BBC Derby and, uh, and obviously the local paper. And, uh, and they watched my game against Wrexham, which is three days before I got sacked, who played Wrexham in the Cup at Wrexham. And he says, you know, that's probably the, the perfect performance that you've been telling us for three, four months how you want to play. And I said, yeah, that's absolutely spot on, spot on. Because that game, we scored the three unbelievable goals. We, we, we totally controlled possession, I think, 70-30 possession to us. We made over 600 passes with a 90% plus uh, success rate in, in, in terms of keeping possession. And that, I always share that them information with the players. That's where we need to be as a team. Every now and then, it's not going to work out, but we, that's, that's what we need to be as a team. So when people come in and watch us, they think, yeah, they play good football. They play good, attractive football. That, when it doesn't work out, the fans will start booing you, or oh, just get it forward. Uh, all those things were, you know, and as owners, probably they, they get influenced by the, the crowd. And I'm thinking, well, I, I just want to do, not just develop myself as a coach, develop my players as well. Mm-hmm. That was related me. Finding a good way of playing football, uh, made me turn up to work every day. I've done the bit where I have to go and get results at any cost, go and head it and kick it and do that. Football moved on, and I want to evolve with the game. I, um, Dino, I um, really endorse um, an awful lot of what you said there, and I think uh, you did an absolutely wonderful job at Burton Albion. And for what it's worth, not just because you you sat um, you sat in front of me, I, I I wouldn't have made the decision that the Burton Albion board did. I think that you absolutely earned the, the the opportunity to really build something with that football club, and I do think it's a shame that you weren't given that chance. Um, what I would probably uh, say is when clubs 
um, uh, appoint a manager. They appoint a manager with evidence that they can carry out a particular uh, job uh, yeah. with and have uh, proven themselves to have that skill set. So if you want a, um, a job at, a, at an ambitious top 10 club in League One, I would say that you've got to have proven yourself to have really established a clear style of play consistently at a club and um, and to have um, had a team competing either for the playoffs or for automatic promotion. Yeah, I and, I, and I would say just you've, you've had a big say, so let me just finish off on this point, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I would say for you to absolutely prove yourself to be capable of doing that. I would say maybe you do need to take a job that might be a little bit lower than League One in order to come back into League One to get the sort of opportunities that you've been talking about. No, you're making an absolute valid point there uh, because, you know, top 10 League One, they're looking for a manager who's been, uh, who's available, who's, who don't do that more, just left today. So he'll be mm -hmm. favoured for any top 10 because they've proven that sure. they can get promoted. promoted. Uh, the jobs I'm going to get... Uh, a team that's struggling, they're going to say, I'll tell you what, Dino Mamaria, he knows how to do that job like the back of his hand, we're going to get him in, he's going to keep us up. Okay, the the dilemma with that job, um, at Burton, and by the way, I love my time at Burton, I had a brilliant with the football club, with the fans, yeah. uh, with the chairman, with everybody, and and I left the club uh, happy where I left them, I left them much better position where I took them. The problem is, when you were Burton, Albion in League One, or Akron to Stanley, or Cheltenham Town, or those clubs, you can only stay there for so long. Absolutely. Uh, and, and for me, the difficult one was, I've done the staying up bit. Yes, I, I know. Backs to the wall, I know exactly, let's do this. This season, I want to be a little bit more than that. So I knew that I didn't have the resources to go on and, and be top, top three or top five or top six. Sure. We couldn't. We could. So I thought, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to prove the players I've got, and I want to create a brand of football that will stimulate me and my players, make us better. Okay, that's not going to happen overnight. It's process, isn't it? You can't get players from heading into kicking it to try and play from the back overnight. It's going to, you know, Pep, I don't think he won any title for his first season. I'm not comparing myself with Pep. Yeah. But I agree with you in terms of your point. Is But there was some good projects that I would have liked to be involved in. You know, if you look at if you look at the bottom three in, the, in League Two, let's say, uh, Danny Cowley took a very, very intelligent job, Colchester, yeah. because Colchester is not just about keeping them up this season. They got the resources to go again. Uh, Carl Robinson took Salford. It's not just about keeping them up this season. You know, you keep them up this season, and then next season they'll have a competitive budget to go again. David Artel at Grimsby as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when I'm looking at something, I'm thinking, can can I, if I'm taking a job at the bottom two or bottom three or or bottom of the league, I know I can do the job this season. Have, have they got the resources to back me to go again next season? Hmm. And 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 like you said, if if you go to you know if you go to Cheltenham and I look at Dara Clark, he's doing an amazing job at Cheltenham, hmm. and I'm thinking I've done that job before. Where are you going to go there and next season? What, what are you going to do next season? You're going to struggle again, <laughs> you know. And, yeah. and that really, really affects you as a manager because it's tough. Yeah. It's tough because it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. Especially in League One, I think in League Two, you definitely see your stories like Crew and Barrow, who are sort of surprising Close. a few people. But yeah, I think yeah. it's hard to do that in uh, in League One, isn't it? League, League One is brutal. League One is brutal, and uh, and and that's why I think uh, this season is not as strong as it was last season. League One, by the way, but still very, very strong. There is, a, there is three leagues within the league, if that makes sense, uh, and and very very unlikely if you uh, if you if your budget is bottom four budget, very very unlikely you're going to be top ten team. Very unlikely, um, top six is impossible because the resources are huge on those places. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's like I said earlier. I think I think as a manager, I think my win ratio as a manager overall is thirty nine percent. I think forty percent, thirty nine percent. But actually, if you look at it, I'm actually all the jobs I manage, they're bottom four teams. Yeah. So if you uh, if you take the top four team, your win ratio is going to increase anyway because you've got better players anyway. Uh, it's it's all about the job you're taking. It's all about obviously, you know, when, when you speak to a chairman, you, my first question to anybody I speak to, what what does success look like for you as a football club first and foremost? And then, and then we take it from there. We see if we can work from there or we can't. Uh, sometimes you're not aligned, sometimes you're aligned. 
but I see, you know, uh, the market is really competitive now. And like you said, uh, I think the, you see that they were bottom three, I think, in, in League mm-hmm. Two. They've been taken by top League One managers, you know. Steve Cotter got Forrest Green, Carl Robinson went to Salford, and uh, the Cowleys went to Colchester. That's how tough the market is. Yeah. Uh, but I see why they took those jobs as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, when you look at the the standard of managers in the bottom half of League Two, it shows how competitive uh, the industry is. Um, I, I do want to actually um, pick up on that point that you said about um, uh, you know talking to clubs because I want to ask you, you know, what would um, in terms of operationally, what would the sort of job that you want look and feel like in terms of possibly working with a sporting director? Because at Burton Albion, you didn't really have an awful lot of support on an operational level and you seem to be sort of around the club a lot. Uh, would you like someone who's a bit more of a steadying presence that allows you to focus on being on the grass a bit more? I think you'd have to. Uh, the modern game uh, is evolving all the time. And I don't think, uh, listen, if someone offered me a good manager's job, I'm not going to turn it down. But you're always evolving, and uh, and I think uh, the modern game you'll have to evolve a sporting director. You have to evolve structure uh, for uh, recruitment, uh, for performance, for you know. Like I've had so many injuries this season at Burton Albion, and people says, well, "Well, why you had all these injuries?" Well, we lost our physio. We didn't really. We didn't replace him. We lost our uh, head of sports science. We didn't really replace him. So. When you and that's what I've learned from it. You, you need you need the you need enough support staff. Mm-hmm. We all we all in the job to produce high perform to create high performing environment. Absolutely. And you, you can't do that without those uh, support mechanism around you as a head coach or as a manager for sure. And mm-hmm. and you go whichever level you're at. And I understand every club got its resource and everything else. And uh, sometimes you got to do what you can with what you got. But eventually that will catch up with you. Eventually, if you keep uh, not cutting corners, but punching above your weight, uh, the game is a leveler. And that's that's sure. the biggest thing I've learned. I think you can get away with it for a year, two years. Eventually, uh, it level out. And if you're not investing wisely, if you're not investing in the infrastructure, the staff, the, uh, the squad, uh, it's going to catch up with you. Yeah, you can get manage. You hear about managers just getting mentally drained when they've got so they're overwhelmed after a certain period to focus on so many things. You want to give them sort of condense their energy so that you can get the best quality in terms of um, management on the things that they should be focusing on. And uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on with that. And I do want to go back to that uh, eighteen nineteen Stevenage side because that sort of box I would call it of uh, Michael Timlin and Joel Byram in midfield and Ben Nugent and Scott Puck. Scott Cuthbert, Scott Cuthbert, even yeah. um, at centre back. Uh, how important was that to the sort of resilience that you wanted um, at Borough? Well, actually, we. Uh, it, it's funny how now a lot of teams they play uh, a three-four-three with a box. Mm. We were playing that in 2019 at Stevenage before even it becomes like you know. Uh, I remember playing uh, a back three of uh, Ben Eugen to Scott Cuthbert and and Terence Van Kooten. Yeah. yeah, playing uh, playing uh, left wing back Joe. Uh, I forgot his name now. Martin. Yeah, and a uh, right bit wing back Luther. And I was playing with two sitters in terms of Michael Timlin and John Byron, and two tens in Ilias Chair and uh, and Sunupe with oh, yeah. uh, Guthrie as a nine. So we found that formula, and and we went on an unbelievable run with that formula. And that's before everybody else starts going with. Uh, with, with a lot of people now, they're playing the 3-4-3 three, three with the box, and you see it, especially League mm-hmm. One, everybody more or less plays it. Uh, but we've been playing, we were playing that five years ago. And, uh, and yeah, when you find the right formula with the right players to fit in that formula, uh, it, it becomes unbelievable because the front three at the time was Ilias Chair playing behind, finding pocket, uh, Sunupi's pace, uh, dropping mm-hmm. deep to get on the ball. And Curtis Guthrie, he's a, he's a goal scorer, he stays in the box. So, and then Tiblin and Joe Byron, really good footballers sitting on the base. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, when you find when you find the right formula, it can really be successful. We've done that last season as well. I think uh, last season at Burton, second half of the season when we played in a similar way with the box as well, three four three with the box, uh, it was very very effective as well. 
Absolutely. Um, and I want to ask you about Terence Van Keaton, actually, because he, in his early years at Stevenage, he seems to struggle with injury. But I spoke to a lot of fans at that time and they could see that he had the potential to go on uh, if he could find his fitness. You must be sort of quite satisfied to see him make the progress that he has now over, over the last couple of years. Well, actually, Terence, he wasn't his fitness at the time. It was his mentality, probably. He came from, okay. we signed him from Reading, I think. And he was, academy players came in from under 21 level where you, you're unaccountable. He played without any accountability. Uh, you can see he's technically really good. He got all the attributes to be a really top player. I'm actually surprised because I think he could have played championship. He should play championship because he had all the attributes. He just didn't put them together. And and then when the penny dropped, when he realized every game is, is a stake, you play playing a stake. And, and now it's good to see him doing really well in a good team. And and who knows, he might get promoted to series this season and he played championship. But as a player, he's obviously had pace. He's really good with the ball and, and good in there. So he got all the attributes of a modern centre-back. Yeah, certainly has. Um, do you think... Um... I mean, the um, the decision the club made seven games into the following campaign, I suppose, a parallel to the situation at Burton. Do you feel a bit sort of miffed at sort of maybe having done so much really good work at a football club and not given the amount of time? Because managers these days, it kind of goes back to our earlier point, they seem to get sacked over bad form than necessarily yeah, yeah. The, the bigger picture. And so, yeah. something feels a little bit unjust about that, I think. Yeah, I think uh, I, I like to think those football clubs learn from it. And now it's happening more than ever, you know. You, you get you get one bad spell and you're out. And let's face it, every manager will have a bad spell. There is no doubt about it. Uh, you'd like to think that the clubs see like the bigger picture. Yeah. And uh, the problem is with the, or with the, not the forums, but the social media is there. And, uh, and, and club owners, they get pressured to making decisions sometimes, I guess, even, you know, just to, to keep everybody happy, if that makes sense, because they want the punter yeah. coming through the gate. Sure. Uh, yeah, you, you can't sack a manager after seven games. You can't sack a manager for losing four games. And, you know, I, I left uh, Burton 18th, 19th in the league, five points away from the bottom four. It's, you know, I, yeah. you've seen in the month of October when I had everybody fit, what we capable of? We were ninth. Mid-October, we were ninth. <laughs> you, you can't, people surely, I've done that job last season. We go through bad spells. You know what I'm about. You know that my team is not going to be down the bottom four. Actually, when everybody fit, we're going to be looking up to top, top, to, to, the, the top end of the table, the top half of the table. No doubt about it. Mm. But you get. I, I remember we played Carla. We played Bristol Rovers. Would be the four one. Then the following game Tuesday, we played Carlisle where we lost two one. The next home game, and we were in a brilliant run. The end of the Carlisle away. We played Orient at home and we drew nil nil. Uh, I think we might have been 10th in the league, 11th in the league. We got booed the final whistle after Orient game, we drawing nil nil. And that probably me shocked me because thinking, wow, you know, that's the because yeah. we want to play a little bit more football, we want to play football back, we want to do that. And I'm like thinking, well, that's the almost you are a victim of your own success because we've been a lot winning a lot of games. Last home games would be Bristol Rovers 4 1. Yeah. Uh, the game before that would be Wigan. Uh, the mm -hmm. game before that, I can't remember, we won a few games. Eh? And I'm like thinking, well, all of a sudden we're drawing against Orient and it's a bad result now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the crazy, the, the crazy world of football, but that's why. Do, it do, is. You think, um, do you think people in society generally, because I, I don't want to make this about any set of fans, because I think it happens across football now, but do you course, think in yeah. society we're actually a bit more impatient as people and, um, you know, we, we often want the next thing, you know, a bit earlier than, than maybe we, we, we did in previous eras? Oh, for sure. There is no doubt about it. Uh, and, and like I said, I think the. the the average manager is 12 months, which is ridiculous, really, because mm -hmm. to build a team and to build a structure, to build a way of playing and everything, yes, 12 months is not, it's just it's, it's business. And, uh, and and my decision this season, probably, I want to to win. I've done a lot of winning at Burton Albion first season. This season, I want to win playing well. The biggest thing for me, I want to improve players, develop players. Mm -hmm. I want to, to enjoy coaching the players. I want my player to enjoy having the football. I want us to go and dominate possession. Uh, I want us, you know, the results will come. Uh, there is no doubt. But, but I want to add a way of playing. That's the, that's the, that's what stimulated me and my squad. And listen, uh, you know, you, you get booed one or two games, and and funny, you, you get, and then you get 
when I got sacked, I think my phone was overwhelmed with messages from the Albi fans thanking me for the job I've done and everything else. So mm. I think the fans realize uh, that, listen, that might be too soon. But listen, uh, Burton Albin, they got a new manager now. They've got Matt Patterson. Uh, they still got, still got the same players. I don't think they're going to be ever in danger. I don't think they'll ever be in danger as long as they keep the squad, the core main players are fit, they won't be in any danger. Uh, mm. They're still in the same position more or less when I left them. Uh, I think League One this season is easier than last season because if you look at the bottom three, um, I think they will struggle in the bottom three. I mm. think there is one more position probably to to fight for in terms of relegation. Uh, mm. But exciting over the top end of the table, the other side of it, because it's very, very close. Yeah, I think Burton will be fine, but I think in the long term, they've got to have a bit more of a vision of how to try and move forward. And if they can bring in some sort of, you know, director of football, um, you look at Stevenage, they've got a really good one in Leon Hunter. And that's part of why I think they've done as well as they have. Like, um, I know it's not always easy and money's tight and all Yeah, it's, I tried. I tried to, you try to do that. And you, and you look at, listen, Burton will stay up this season. Uh then the next season is the is going to be another challenge, isn't it? And, sure. and, and next season, will this manager then have a bad bunch of results? Will he go as well? And then the same circuit again. So, yeah. like I said, I says when you were a small club, and, and I, I've got a lot of admiration for Akinzo Stanley because I can Stanley yeah. they, they survived five years, I think, in the league. Five years, yeah, correct. Yeah, they, they got relegated. They got relegated not because John Coleman is a bad manager. John Coleman is not a bad manager. He's a good manager. It's just because because he levels out. But it's yeah. good for the club to stick by him. Mm. And they, they didn't go and sack him when they were bottom four last season. They didn't want to, you know, do any... They went a, a lot of bad runs of losing, losing, but they didn't sack him because they see the bigger picture. They're thinking, well, actually, over five years, he kept us in League One with a small budget. So mm. uh, I, I understand that. I, I think, yeah, that's, that's good management from the top, if that makes sense, because they see the big picture. Uh, mm. But the smaller clubs, especially in League One, who keep going back to League One, you do really well to stay up this season. The next season is going to be a big challenge. Are you going to say, are you going to compete again with the same budget? You can't. Even if you were fluke at another year, then the following season, and that's where probably was the end of the road for me, which is which is probably in both ways. That I'm thinking, well, actually, fight relegation again, uh, backs against the wall, having 25 percent possession every game, boot and kicking every ball, doing that, it didn't stimulate me enough. I want to move on a little bit. I'm, I can. I back myself as being a good coach, first and foremost, good manager, yeah. good leader of men. I want to make better players, players better around me. I want them to move on to play a championship, to play a better level. And to do that, I have to improve them as well. Mm. Recruitment, Dino. Um, I think that's something that can make a break, make or break a manager. Because, uh, for example, in the second uh, Great Escape under your uh, coaching or management, um, yeah, you had a brilliant January window. Brought in the likes of, um, uh, like you met Mark Helm, uh, Jasper Moon, I think, and uh, Dale Taylor, and it made a massive difference. So um, you've also had um, other, you've had other windows that were as successful as that one maybe one or two that probably didn't go to plan. So with all the sort of knowledge and wisdom that you've sort of acquired on a successful transfer window, what does that look and feel like uh, for you? Okay, transfer window, uh, in every club, it's different. Because, so if you look at my, uh, if I look at last January, it was a, it was a window where I have to bring players, going to make an instant impact, long players, most of them, by the way, uh, to make an instant impact to keep the club in League One. You can do that. Then in the summer, I had, I think, nine players signed in the summer. I knew that I'm going to recruit another 10 players, 10, 11 players. 10, 11 players in one window in the summer is too much. The club in the, past, the previous two or three years not doing enough to keep a core of players. Then you end up losing one or two, Terry Taylor losing to Charlton. Then that makes eight players, I think, or seven players in your books. That itself, when you're recruiting that many players, it's always a risk. You're never going to get, you do really well to get 50% spot on. Hmm. If I look back at my twins in the summer, I brought the players, they're all at good age. Apart from probably Cole Stockton, who's in late 20s, uh, the goalkeeper's late 20s, but the rest of them are good age. So if I look at Rakim Harper, Rakim Harper is 23. I knew when Burton Albin recruited Joe Powell, Joe Powell, he wasn't instant success. 
he wasn't using it out of the team. Eventually, he became, and now every League One club and some championship clubs after him, uh, Keg's choke from Southampton. He's another one. It's his project because of the money I've got. I can't go and get the top, the ready made League One player. I've got to go and get something with potential with over time is going to be a good player. Would those two be good players? 100%. Terry Taylor, we end up selling to Charlton. Terry Taylor, when he first came, he didn't play. He was struggling to play. He was at one point, he was going to leave the club. So yeah. again, uh, you got to persevere with young players. So a club like Burton Albi, you have to, let's not judge those players, they fail straight away. You got to persevere with them. You know, Mark Hans had his ups and downs as well. So Sam Hughes, when he came, he didn't hit the, the ground running, but eventually Ryan Sweeney, the, the centre-back, sorry, mm. uh, he's, he didn't, when he first came in, he came from the Scottish Championship. You got to understand that. He came to play Scottish Championship, not Scottish Premier League, to go to League One. He struggled at the beginning. Now he's an absolute mountain the, in the team. So club like Burton Albion, you got to, rather than calling them failure straight away, because the, the failure, when you, you didn't break the bank with them, they are in League Two budget, and you're trying to make them good League One players. That's that's the job that I had to do in the summer. And the biggest for, unfortunate one probably is probably called Stockton, the one where he got uh, injured against Leicester. He was out for 10, 11 weeks. That's probably the only one where I think mm, that's the one that really didn't work out for us. Hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so... I think the way that uh, football management is uh, is going, it's always about uh, taking, uh, you've always got to keep getting better as a manager because the game's evolving, new ideas are coming in and you've got to keep keep getting better. So what does the bigger, better, wise and reflected Dino Marmara 2.0 version uh, that you can offer to clubs, what does that look like for you? Well, uh, when we've done well last season, why did not uh, clubs? Why didn't I not I move on to say the championship? You, you look at you look at some of the managers that move on. The first thing is they have to play attractive football. So for me to move on, uh, and I, I have to implement a, a philosophy of playing good attractive football. That now the modern game you have to you have to evolve, yeah. and that's obviously what I try to do. But tell me, if I close my eyes, what's what's Dino's Maria's team is going to look like? It's going to look youthful, first and foremost. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be attacking. It's going to be pace, power, and ferocious will to win and commitment. Those things probably, if I close my eyes, I want my team to, to do that. I want them to play attractive football, attacking football, score goals. Uh, they might constitute two or three, but by scoring goals, uh, I want. Uh, Pace and power, because the, the, the modern game, you've got to have pace and power in the team. You have to dominate possession and you have to play with purpose as well. You have to play to win. It's not about making 600 passes. I want to make 600 passes and win games as well. So that's my, that's how, you know, what, while I'm out of work, I'm trying to figure out what my team looks like, what my next job is going to be. And, and actually, even in the summer, that's the team that I was trying to build at Burton Albion, bringing KB from, the, from what I would have been it was unbelievable. Those mm -hmm. type starting players, pace, power, pace, power, attacking intent, and uh, and that's the team that I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to manage next. Well, Dino, we wish you well, and I'm sure it's going to be an exciting uh, next chapter of your career. So, uh, thanks for talking to us, and uh, wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, Gabby. Appreciate uh, reaching out for me. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you as always. Legend Dino. Uh, this has been EFL Debate. Thanks to you for watching at home. We'll see you again next time. Thank you, guys.